Malcolm Little was born in Omaha in 1925. He was one of six children born to Earl Little and Louise Little. Malcolm's father was a Baptist preacher and his mother was a writer for Marcus Garvey's newspaper. But due to their defiant stance against racism and their staunch activism within the black community, the family was compelled to abandon their home and to relocate to Milwaukee in 1926. But shortly thereafter, circumstances compelled them to relocate once more. This time, they settled in Lansing, Michigan. You were born in Omaha, is that right? Yes, sir. And you left, your family left Omaha when you were what, one year old? I imagine about a year old. And why did they leave Omaha? Well, to my understanding, uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, burned down one of their homes in uh, in uh, in Omaha. This, a lot of this made your family feel very unhappy, I'm sure. Well, insecure, if not unhappy. However, as in their previous homes, the family suffered frequent harassment and intimidation at the hands of local white supremacists. Soon after they moved to Lansing, their new home was burned to the ground. Tragically, the family was never compensated for their loss. The house burned down to the ground. No fire wagon came, nothing. And we were burned out. This traumatic incident would in the tender heart of Malcolm Little entrench a bitter sentiment of vengefulness and abhorrence for the white power structure. Unfortunate as it was, this tragedy was not to be the last for Malcolm or for his family. On a fateful September night, in 1931, when Malcolm was only six years old, his father was brutally murdered and dismembered by some local members of the KKK. His mutilated remains were found on a railway track the next morning. The homicide was dismissed by the authorities and officially ruled to be a mere accident. Some even implied that Malcolm's father had in fact committed suicide. But Malcolm, now a six-year-old orphan, would grow up with the conviction that his father was murdered by a group of white supremacists. The incident was not a novelty to Malcolm or to his siblings, as three of their uncles had already been killed by racist thugs. In 1938, Seven years following the murder of his father, Malcolm's mother suffered a nervous breakdown and was sent to a mental unit in Kalamazoo State Hospital. She remained there for almost a quarter of a century, secluded from her home and from her family. Sadly, resulting from this painful course of events, Malcolm and his siblings would be split up and sent to live 
in different foster homes. The young Malcolm excelled at West Junior High, where he was the only black student in attendance. In fact, during the seventh grade, he was elected class president. However, he left school and abandoned his studies in the eighth grade. When his English teacher had informed him that black boys could not become lawyers, such were the accepted norms of society. Understandably, Malcolm felt that the white world afforded no place for an intelligent and industrious black man, regardless of his ambitions and attitude. Having dropped out of school at the age of 14, Malcolm sought new opportunities in Boston, where he settled with his half-sister Ella. She resided in the middle-class locality of Roxbury. Then after a short time in Boston, Malcolm moved to Harlem in New York in 1943. Soon after his arrival in Harlem, the young Malcolm became acquainted with the underground scene and became an initiate in the dark underworld of drug dealing, gambling, extortion, robbery and pimping. Malcolm was dazzled by the nightlife in downtown Harlem, which he used to call the Technicolor Bazaar. Well, he had the reputation as being a hustler. And he was a street person, but he was a hustler. At only 17 years of age, Malcolm already had a street reputation and a significant network of criminal contacts in Harlem. As his profile developed in Harlem, Malcolm operated under a street name of Detroit Red. It was called Red because of the reddish hair he inherited from his Scottish grandfather. But by 1946, at the age of 20, Malcolm was convicted on charges of burglary. He was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. He eventually served seven years at Charlestown State Prison and was released in 1952. As a prisoner, Malcolm soon earned himself the nickname of Satan. He was called Satan because of his intense hatred for God and religion. In prison, Malcolm met a man called John Bembry, who was commonly known as Bimby. Malcolm had a profound respect for Bimby, who was a self-educated convict who had reformed himself and taken to serious studies while in prison. Under the guidance and encouragement of Bimby, Malcolm had developed an appetite for books that can only be described as Epicurean in proportions, and such literary indulgence that eventually led to his weakening eyesight and heavy stigmatism, subsequently resulting in his much needed use of glasses for the rest of his life. Yet despite this setback, Malcolm consumed knowledge like a desert rose consumes sunlight. By the time he served his sentence, Malcolm had read large volumes of classical text. He had engaged in many prison debates with visiting scholars from Harvard and MIT. That's when Malcolm's name and fame started spreading amongst the prison population. And that's when the, uh, the population started to grow at the debating classes. Most of the fellows used to come over out of curiosity just to hear him speak. During his seven years in prison, Malcolm received a letter from his brother Philbert, informing Malcolm that he had discovered the natural religion for the black man. Philbert and the rest of Malcolm's siblings had by now joined a movement called the Nation of Islam and they were now inviting Malcolm to also join them. So I wrote to Malcolm and uh, told him about, I said to him if he would believe in Allah, that he would get out of prison. And that's all I wrote because I know he, would, he had very low tolerance for religion and I didn't intend to lose that tolerance. But to this invite, Satan responded with fierce opposition. A short while following the first correspondence, Malcolm received another letter. This time, it was from his brother, Reginald. Malcolm thought that the letter was some kind of clever strategy or a hype written in coded language to help him escape prison. This feeling of excitement gave him much hope. 
and enthusiasm. In 1948, Malcolm wrote a letter to the leader of the Nation of Islam seeking counsel. Elijah Muhammad personally responded to Malcolm's letter, advising him to renounce his criminal past, to submit to Allah and to make an oath that Malcolm would never return to his former lifestyle. This marked the beginning of a friendship between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. In 1950, Malcolm had changed his name to Malcolm X. He also began to espouse radical ideas and racially biased worldviews as he became more and more influenced by the false doctrines and teachings of Elijah Muhammad. In August 1952, after Malcolm had served his term in jail and was released on parole, he traveled to Chicago to pay a personal visit to Elijah Muhammad in his own home. By June 1953, he was promoted to the rank of assistant minister. He initially served in a temple in Detroit. Later that year, he established a new temple in Boston. And by March 1954, he established another temple in Philadelphia. Then just two months later, he was promoted once more. This time, he was given the leadership of temple number seven in Harlem. Malcolm successfully recruited many supporters and new converts to the Nation of Islam. By 1955, resulting from Malcolm's enthusiastic drive and compelling rhetoric, thousands of African Americans were now bolstering the ranks of the Nation of Islam, with numbers rising each and every month. Alarmed by the rapid rise of Malcolm X, the FBI soon opened a file and began to monitor his progress. Malcolm was credited with the organization's dramatic increase in membership, from 500 members to over 45,000 members in a short period of time during which he was initiated as a minister within the movement. Malcolm even inspired the young boxer, Cassius Clay, later to be known as Muhammad Ali, encouraging him to join the Nation of Islam way before he became the heavyweight world champion. And in June 1963, Malcolm organized and headed the Unity Rally in Harlem, which was one of America's largest civil rights events. Later that year, the New York Times had reported that Malcolm X was now the second most popular speaker in the United States of America. Successful as he was, Malcolm's rising popularity and growing influence began to ruffle a few feathers and provoked some discontent from within the movement. Some members began to suspect that Malcolm was becoming even more influential than their leader, Elijah Muhammad. This jealousy and resentment would be the cause of a major rift between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. On December the 1st, 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated in broad daylight. The nation was in deep mourning. In an interview following the assassination, when asked what his opinions were on the assassination of the president, Malcolm's response was frank and unapologetic. He expressed his opinion that it was a case of chickens coming home to roost. This statement prompted a series of reactions from across America and within the Nation of Islam itself. Malcolm X was condemned by the Nation of Islam and he was banned from giving any public lectures for 90 days. Malcolm now found himself isolated, silenced and abandoned by his own brothers. In March 1964, within a few months of having been silenced, Malcolm X publicly announced his official departure from the Nation of Islam. Malcolm X also expressed an earnest desire to collaborate with other civil rights leaders and groups. He then established the Organization for Afro-American Unity and founded the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Soon after his exit from the Nation of Islam, 
several Sunni Muslims encouraged Malcolm to abandon the false doctrines of the Nation of Islam and to learn about the true Islam. Malcolm accepted their invitation and after careful contemplation and consideration, he embraced Orthodox Islam. In April 1964, Malcolm X embarked on the Hajj, the sacred pilgrimage to the heartland of Islam in modern-day Saudi Arabia. A day following his arrival in Jeddah, Malcolm X was informed that the Crown Prince Faisal had extended a personal invite welcoming Malcolm as an honored guest of the kingdom. And in a gesture of brotherhood and kindness, Malcolm X was entertained and hosted by King Faisal himself following the Hajj ceremonies. How would they accept you as one? You're an American, there are few American Muslims. This is true, and by being an American and not having uh, any, not being able to speak the Arabic language, I did strike a snag, a very serious snag, but I was fortunate uh, to have been pretty well known by the officials in Arabia, and they knew too that I had uh, accepted Orthodox Islam, it had been highly publicized in the paper, and I became a guest of the state. I was a guest of who? Of Prince Faisal, the present King Faisal. Faisal. And they made it possible for me to go before the committee, Hajj committee or Hajj court, who examines you and, and asks you questions about your belief. And if you pass it, then you are okay to go to Mecca. But it's you would true. have to have a translator then. Uh, oh, I had one. From Mecca, the holy city of Islam, I wrote to friends in America. Never have I witnessed such sincere hospitality and true brotherhood as is practiced here in this ancient holy land, the home of Abraham, Muhammad, and all the other prophets of the holy scriptures. You may be shocked at these words coming from me, but what I have seen has forced me to rearrange much of my thought patterns previously held, to toss aside some of my previous conclusions. For during the past 11 days, I've eaten from the same plate, drunk from the same glass, slept on the same rug, and prayed to the same God with fellow Muslims whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde, and whose skin was the whitest of white. We are truly the same because their belief in one God has removed the white from their minds, the white from their behavior, and the white from their attitudes. Do you feel that, that your message, uh, uh, apparent message of love that you brought back from Islam is, is the real reason they're <laughs> after you, because you're not hating as hard as they want you to? Well, I never did hate anybody hard, uh, but, I, but I do know that when I wrote that letter saying that there were white people in Mecca, it shook up a lot of Muslims, because most of the Muslims who follow Mr. Muhammad absolutely believe that it was impossible, physically impossible, I should say divinely impossible, for a white person to go to Mecca. Uh, and my trip there uh, shattered that image or that misconcept. Soon after his enlightened journey to Mecca and Hajj Malik al Shabazz, as he now came to be known in the Muslim world, embarked on a trailblazing tour of Africa. During these visits, he met officials, gave interviews, spoke on national television and on radio stations in various countries, such as Egypt. Ethiopia, Tanzania, Nigeria, Ghana, Guinea, Sudan, Senegal, Liberia, Algeria, and Morocco. Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, and Ahmed Ben Bella of Algeria had each invited Malcolm X to serve as a minister in their governments. When my father was abroad, we had a world map on the living room wall. And any time he got a little lonesome and wondered where daddy was, we'd run over to that map. And where is he now? And he's in Cairo, which is the capital of Egypt. And he's over here with Nkrumah. And he's over here. So there was a different kind of passage that we maintained when he was abroad. Following a speech at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, the Muslim Students Association honored Malcolm with the Yoruba name of Omawale, which means the son who has returned home. By the time Malcolm left Africa, he had met 
with most of the continent's leaders. In November 1964, on his way back home from Africa, Malcolm stopped in Paris, where he delivered a lecture at the Salle de la Mutualité. A week later, Malcolm flew to the United Kingdom, and on December the 3rd, he participated in a debate at the Oxford Union. The debate was so highly anticipated that it was televised across the nation by the BBC. BBC World Service. Malcolm's reach and influence had outgrown the racial boundaries set by the Nation of Islam. He was no longer just a civil rights activist. He now became a human rights activist. Are you prepared to go into the United Nations at this point and ask that charges be brought against the United States for its treatment of American Negroes? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. Please. I think you're right in my chair. The audience will have to be quiet. <laughs> uh, yes, the, as I pointed out when I was in, during my traveling, that nations look, African nations and Asian nations and Latin American nations look very hypocritical when they stand up in the United Nations condemning the racist practices of South Africa and that which is practiced by Portugal and Angola and saying nothing in the UN about the racist practices uh, that are, that are uh, manifest every day against Negroes in this society. Even in South Africa, those Africans uh, aren't faced with bayonets and aren't faced with police dogs. And I, when I was in Beirut, I saw a picture on the front page of a Negro being beaten in Tennessee, on the front page of the paper in Beirut. When I got to Cairo, I saw the same picture of a Negro being beaten in Tennessee. When I got to Lagos, I saw the same picture. So uh, where these African nations, knowing the brutality that is inflicted upon black people in this country, simply because those black people are trying to get what the Supreme Court said they were supposed to have 10 years ago, I, I would be not a man. If I was in a position to bring it in front of the United Nations and didn't do so, I wouldn't be a man. Malcolm X had expressed his desire to work with other organizations and leaders in order to present a legal case at the International Court for Human Rights in an unprecedented effort to bring charges against the United States for its gross human rights violations against the poor, marginalized, and brutalized African-American community. Are you prepared to work with some of the leaders of the other civil rights organizations? Certainly. Certainly. We will work with any uh, groups, organizations, or leaders in any way, as long as it's genuinely designed to get results. Martin Luther King, Jr and Malcolm X met before a press conference after the state senate debate on the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This meeting marked the beginning of what many people saw as a bright prospect for a golden union between the two leaders and a possible joint effort to cooperate and collaborate with one another. Had a beautiful sense of humor, plus the fact that when you got to know him, he was kind of shy. El Hajj Malik al Shabazz was remarkably charismatic. He was an eloquent orator and had an impressive physical presence. At six foot three, he had an imposing yet gentle composure. One journalist described him as mesmerizingly handsome and always spotlessly well groomed. In 1955, Betty Sanders met Malcolm X after one of his lectures. She would soon be attending many of his lectures more regularly. Although they never discussed marriage, Malcolm proposed to sister Betty over the phone in 1958. They married only two days later and became parents to six beautiful daughters. He sometimes if I could catch them, would have to read to the children. They would always want the story read again so that they would really just wait until he was on the last page and said, read it again, read it again, read it again. You know, and so that he started giving the books different endings. Malcolm's departure from the Nation of Islam had been preceded by growing tensions between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. 
particularly over rumours concerning Elijah Muhammad's adulterous relationships with some of his teenage secretaries. Are you not, perhaps, afraid of what might happen to you as a result of making these revelations? Oh, yes. I probably am a dead man already. After his ignoring the rumours, Malcolm's suspicions were confirmed when he spoke to Elijah Muhammad's own son, Wallace Muhammad. The suspicions were also validated by the testimonies of some of the young women who had been sexually exploited by Elijah Muhammad himself. So I told him, yes, I said, I know, I know about that. I say, you can see things, but you, but, but you uh, don't want to see it, so you just blot it, blot, blot, blot it out your mind. I said, I'm aware of secretaries uh, having that kind of relationship with my father, being there with their children. I said, I've seen him take their children, and, and uh, somewhere in my conscience, I'm sure it was registering that that was his family, but I never accepted it to deal with it in my mind. Never did I accept to deal with it in my mind. But by now, there were rumors circulating that highly placed members of the Nation of Islam were plotting to kill Malcolm X. Why are they threatening your life? Well, uh, primarily because they're afraid that I will tell the real reason that they've been, that I'm out of the black Muslim movement, which I never told, I kept to myself. But the real, real reason is that Elijah Muhammad, the head of the movement, is the father of eight children by six different teenage girls. Different, uh, six different teenage girls who were his private personal secretary. But the one who first made me aware of this was Wallace Muhammad, Mr. Muhammad's son. The conflict between Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam increased and soon both public and private threats were being made. In February 1964, an attempt was made to wire Malcolm's car with explosives, but it was unsuccessful. In the weeks and months to come, Malcolm's wife would receive a string of anonymous phone calls, each one delivering blood-curdling threats. And on June the 8th, 1964, FBI tapes recorded a man calling Malcolm's home, instructing Sister Betty to tell her husband that he's as good as dead. Had you had any threats, uh, anything like this? Uh, had any threats? That's all I get is threats. I get uh, not less than six or seven threatening uh, phone calls every day. And by June 1964, the Nation of Islam had sued Malcolm X in an attempt to claim his residence in New York. Sadly, Malcolm lost his home and the entire family was ordered to vacate the premises. But the Nation of Islam was not yet satisfied. So on February 14th, 1965, Malcolm's home was burnt to the ground. All of his children were asleep at the time. I wanted you to know that my house was bombed. It was bombed by the black Muslim movement upon the orders of Elijah Muhammad. Now they had come around, so they had planned to do it from the front and the back so that I couldn't get out. By the divine grace of God, Malcolm X and his entire family survived the attempted murder. However, despite the overwhelming evidence, no one was ever charged or brought to justice. This was deeply reminiscent of Malcolm's childhood experience in Lansing three decades ago. The following week, on the 21st of February, 1965, during the final hours of his life, Malcolm X was preparing to deliver a lecture before the Organization of Afro-American Unity in Manhattan's Audubon Ballroom. In fact, the night before he was due to deliver the lecture, Malcolm X felt uneasy about the event. He called his wife and children, informing them to come and visit him the very next day. This was unusual, as by now, he was so aware of the imminent threat to his life that he would strictly forbid his family from attending any of the public meetings, but not on this occasion. Soon after he greeted the audience, there were screams and distressed voices echoed throughout the hall. An unknown man seated in the front row then rushed forward and shot Malcolm. Malcolm 
Malcolm X was pronounced dead at 3.30 p.m., shortly after arriving at Columbus Presbyterian Hospital. On Friday afternoon, his funeral rites and prayers were performed in accordance with Orthodox Islamic teachings by Sheikh Ahmed Hassan, a Sunni cleric who had traveled to the U.S. to serve as Malcolm's spiritual guide and teacher in the final months of his life. But even in his final moments, he stood before the world, courageously fighting to restore the principles of justice, liberty, and the equality of man. went from a criminal operating in Harlem's underworld to becoming a world-class advocate for justice. His career unfolded while he was a physical prisoner, but his achievements blossomed when he became a liberator of hearts and an emancipator of minds. If I judge a man by his conscious behavior, I am not a racist. I don't subscribe to any of the tenets of racism. Then there are good whites and good blacks and bad whites and blacks. It's not a case of being good and bad, good or bad, blacks and whites. It's a case of being good or bad human beings. al Hajj Malik al-Shabazz opened America's eyes to the message of Islam. His example opened many hearts to the collective call of brotherhood. His biography demonstrates the universality of Islam for all people, regardless of race or status. Finally, he rejected racism and embraced racial equality. He submitted himself in humility and dedication before the one and only God. I'm a Muslim. If there is something wrong with that, then I stand condemned. My religion is Islam. I believe in Allah. I believe in Muhammad as the Apostle of Allah. I believe in brotherhood of all men. Thank you.